Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Thinking About Thinking talk, the latest in the series. Um, tonight, we are very pleased to have with us Mr. Arthur Martirosian, um, an old friend of AUA and an old friend of mine as well um, from Boston. Um, he is a process technician. I like that, that name, that particular uh, title better than most of the others, specifically for tonight's uh, talk, because often we think of justice as being a thing. But actually, justice is the result of a process. Uh, and depending on the process, you get a different kind of justice. And sometimes we forget the kinds of informal and formal processes that are involved. And tonight, he's going to talk about one that's sort of in the middle, diplomacy. Um, but there are court processes, and then there are the court of public opinion processes on the other end, which are one very open-ended and one very close-ended. And this is a middle process. Um, so I'm very pleased to have uh, this opportunity um, to bring up two things. One, um, he is our partner at the Center of Excellence, Center for Excellence in Negotiation, um, and co-founder of that as well, um, and the center uh, director is here, Mr. Stefan Pazertian, um, and uh, the center conducts a number of different kinds of projects, including training and research, uh, and also various kinds of consultations and uh, interventions in the field of negotiation. Negotiation is understood in a very broad way as all sorts of dialogues that result, that give us results of different sorts, some better, some worse, and the way we think about them often determines the quality of the result. And with that, I turn the floor over to Mr. Martos. Uh Thank you, Tom. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good evening, everybody. Actually, I prefer to come down and to be talking close to you. Good evening again, Fari Eriko. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, 20 years of my experience of thinking about process, uh, process of negotiation. And I'm going to uh, tell you what um, some of the thinking has led me to believe recently. Much of the influence uh, on the thinking was made by two men, all of them in the um, could be 90s. Roger Fisher, who died last year, he turned 90. And another man, who's uh, Chris Argeris also 90, still alive and still kicking. And I will start with um, Chris Argeris, uh, professor at MIT. He uh, was an expert on uh, organizational learning. Uh, and in fact, he coined the word a uh, learning organization. And much of his writings were about, uh, about processes and different uh, cultural organizations and what processes they have internally and how um, some of the uh, thinking preceding action impacts the outcome. And I will start with this um, a very simple tool that he has. It's a thinking tool. It's uh, called a, a double loop learning. At first, the uh, single loop learning. Uh, that's the man. He's 90. Uh, so single loop learning is this. We do this all the time. We target some desired results, some outcomes. And then to get there, we take some action take actions if um, uh, the results are not really satisfactory what do we do question anyone what do we do right we try to tweak a little bit what we do and then we are in this trial and error process right we go back to our actions we tweak actions we change actions this is the uh, single loop learning uh, or as he was saying, a trial and error approach. Sometimes when we're in conflict, we tend to do this all the time. We do not change anything here. We act the same way, and we're hoping that the results will be somehow different. And the results are not different. Uh, I'd say one of the uh, definitions of uh, schizophrenia is that a human being who is not changing anything and hopes to get different results is uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. But we do this all the time. Uh, or as uh, 
Friedrich Nietzsche used to say, it's a very common form of human stupidity to forget for what goal we are doing this. We tend to forget why we started this, where we're going with this, and we keep doing it. We are in this uh, single loop. So what needs to be done? What's the uh, recommendation of prescription from, uh, uh, from pre surgeries In a book uh, known as uh, Action Science, uh, with some other his colleagues, he described this uh, following uh, this uh, quote from Einstein. The significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. So you need to get a distance from the problem. You have to look at the problem maybe differently from a different angle. And Argus, uh argues that you have to make one more loop. You have to go one more step back to your thinking that preceded, preceded uh, the actions and the, uh, in fact, how you targeted the results. And before thinking, there are assumptions. We we'll all make assumptions about the game we are in and we sometimes call a negotiation a game or a process. So we think that this is the game and it turns out it's not. And I want to bring this um, to our Armenian reality uh, because we are known as, um, or we like to believe that we are a very cerebral nation, that we are capable of thinking about thinking, and I'm sure that we are, and yet we also find ourselves trapped in uh, single loop learning often, and especially on issues that are so important to us. Uh, issues uh, of foreign policy, internal political issues, and whatnot. So we are uh, caught in the single loop, we're not making one more loop here to change our thinking or to change our perception of the game so that it can inform um, our understanding of what results are possible and therefore to take maybe uh, different actions. The best results, and I wanted to talk tonight as Tom mentioned about advocacy and uh, diplomacy, the best results probably is this. Um, you probably all know that uh, President Obama, when he was senator, he did recognize genocide. We all know that. And uh, then uh, when he uh, stepped into the White House, uh, he somehow uh, refused to do that. He was finding uh, other words, Armenian words. His Armenian vocabulary expanded to three words at least. And he found a different way of uh, saying what it is. And there was a question. So our lobbying organizations continued to approach him. And he still would not do that. Every April 24th, we are there, we ask him, and he's saying, no, it's not going to be uh, genocide. So what's the problem? If we continue doing the same thing, we go to him, and he keeps saying no to us, uh, there are several things we can do. What is it the most common reaction to someone saying no to us? Especially if he previously was saying yes. What's the common... Uh, let's make a very simple rule. One person speaks at a time. I wanted this to be uh, very interactive. And to identify who's speaking, it's either me or you. You just raise one finger, and I will know that you want to uh, take on the question. So, yes, please, you were first. Just say no to him. Okay, so one approach is we'll mobilize people and we'll tell every Armenian, next elections, don't vote for Obama. Right, that's one. Okay, so, yes, what else? Uh, protests can be organized. We can organize protests, yes, I that. I would be. You, we can organize protests, yes, and that's what uh, some organizations may have done. Are we getting, though, what we need? We're not getting what we need. We can protest, we can mobilize people. They may vote for any candidate but Obama and it's still not helping us get what we want. Oh, so we now say, wait a second, let's think. Do we really need Obama to say this? Maybe, yeah, that's uh, back to uh, thinking about the problem. But I think the uh, uh, very clear distinction here uh, comes uh, between uh, diplomacy and advocacy. Advocacy and diplomacy are using very different tools. In advocacy, it's very common for someone to, who believes that he's right 
And we all know that we are right. We all know that it was genocide. So if it's also your values, justice is in your values, I'll come and I will demand the justice, right? I will come and say, recognize with me that it was genocide, and he should do that. Otherwise, it's a flip-flop, and you can uh, take any, uh, any words describing that behavior, uh, getting to some maybe very derogatory ones, but doing that won't help us change anything. He's not doing it. So diplomacy probably would take a very different take on this. And diplomacy, some of you have taken, I know, classes in negotiation. Diplomacy would ask a very different question about it. If he's saying no now, what has changed? Why was he saying yes when was his, he was senator? And why is he saying no now? Anyone? It's a formal office. And then he was informal. When he was a senator, he was informal. Because we need uh, an American president to recognize uh, the defense, not uh, the president. Uh, no, he was recognizing as a senator, but I'm saying, what was the difference? Why it was easy for him as a senator to do that? And, yes, please, gentlemen over there. But say loudly, yes. Uh, now he's representing national Ah, very good. So he was talking when he was a senator from the value standpoint. You're saying, I have the same values with you. I share the same values on human rights, and I recognize it was genocide. And the minute he steps into the White House, he has to think differently because he now has to think about national interest. And all his advisors are getting to him and saying, you know what? If you say yes, if you recognize the genocide, there will be damage to American national interests. So, if we are in diplomacy, and my uh, favorite uh, description or definition of uh, diplomacy comes from Daniele Vera, he's an Italian diplomat stationed in uh, China, early 20th century. He said diplomacy is about having them have it our way. I want you to think about it, right? They have to do what I want them to do. That's that's what diplomacy is about. And that's very different from me going out and saying I demand this. And I'm not here to analyze Armenia's foreign policy in the last 20 years. I'm not here to discuss with you whether our lobbying uh, organizations are effective or they're getting there or not. I'm here to think with you on the difference between the two. And as I was thinking about it, I. I, uh, in my uh, mind, it's uh, like two arms. You do need advocacy, but it has its own place. And you do need diplomacy, and that diplomacy needs to be very vibrant, proactive, and it has to be very dynamic, because things keep changing. And on the issue of genocide, and not only on the issue of genocide, we are operating in multi-party environments when we need to negotiate with many parties on many issues. So. If we are not doing that, then advocacy is, seems to be the only tool. It's like having a hammer, and then if you, uh, that, that is the only tool you have, any problem looks like a nail to you, right? So we go out and we demand, and it's not working. Yes, we can reconsider, we can say, Obama, you know what? We don't need your recognition anymore. But do we or we don't? Some are saying yes, we still do. And if we do, then what should we do? Uh, mentally? What would be the process, thinking process, that would allow us to understand how to go about it? And we'll talk about uh, that today. Um, I want to do that even as an exercise. We'll get to it uh, in a second, because I want to share with you uh, something else. When we talk about the Armenian genocide, I have not met yet, maybe there are, but I haven't met yet a single Armenian who uh, would say that we don't need recognition. Maybe there are, I mean, I don't know. There is one hand going up. Uh, we don't need recognition. Uh, then maybe, uh, that's my circle, but most people, if not all in my circle, also believe that recognition has to come with another R, which is reparations. And only then, there should be reconciliation. So, and this makes a lot of sense, because if you look at what's been done, if you look at some objective criteria for us, how others have done this, if you look at the Israeli case, or into the case uh, that is very often uh, 
uh, brought about by some uh, European diplomats who, uh, who say, you know what, you have to turn the page. Okay? It was in the past. Think about future. Don't think about past. Let's go forward. Uh, and I think my, and, and then if you ask them, what's this based on? What's your criteria? They'd say, or oh, remember, Germany and uh, France, two world wars, lots of losses. They turned the page. But that's Erzat's history. That's very primitive history because what happened after World War II? What happened after World War II? Did Germany recognize? They did. Did they pay reparations? Yes. And only after that, there was reconciliation. The same with Israel. Did Adenauer first recognize? Yes, he did. Did uh, Germany pay reparations? Still does in some ways, and if you look at the um, Israeli budget in 1956, and you look at the uh, amount of uh, they were getting in reparations, it would be probably uh, in uh, today's uh, money. It would be probably Armenia's uh, uh, one year's budget. Uh, uh, you know, for decades they were paying that amount for decades. So it was a very critical piece then, and. Yet, we are pushed to think that we somehow can start from here. Let's start from reconciliation, and maybe then there will be re recognition, and maybe there will be reparations. It's a very strange path. I don't have any objective criteria that would support this path. So if um, most of us believe that somehow this needs to happen, except one person who was raising hand in the back, um, uh, then, the question is, how do we go about it? How do we go about this? This is a very uh, challenging task. O obviously, there is theory. Uh, Jean-Paul Lederach, with his uh, very sophisticated thinking about uh, how peace is made between <coughs> nations, uh, came up with this, uh, should look more like a pyramid. Uh, so you have fewer people at the top. Uh, these are actors, the top leadership. That's track one, that's uh, diplomats, that's the uh, uh, presidents of two countries maybe, and uh, very senior uh, folks here at the top. Then you have the middle range. This is the middle section. This is the uh, uh, influentials, right? So opinion makers, uh, maybe uh, well-known journalists, maybe writers, uh, thinkers, uh, whoever has influence in the society. That's, uh, we call it track one and a half. And then there is uh, this grassroots level. And Lederach has argued that if you want to build peace, all sorts of activities need to happen on all, all three levels. So diplomacy here, uh, some advocacy maybe here, and uh, two countries, if they are at war with each other, they will have to go through this process somehow. Um, our case is slightly different. Our case is different from this. So I think these are the uh, influencing, the middle influences, uh, grassroots, grassroots influences needle, then uh, there is pressure here up, uh, connection to the um, influentials. If there are two democracies, argues uh, a letter up, then there can be even this kind of influence, right, from here to here. Our case is very different. I'd argue our case is different, and yet we are proposed to do uh, something like this. We don't have this right now, and if there was, it was not really uh, 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 consistent. This is very thin, very thin, uh, and in fact, right now may not exist. And what we have is this. And this <coughs> is at the grassroots levels, track two. Uh, some call it track three. Uh, my Israeli and Palestinian colleagues uh, have coined a term that is, I think, best describing this. When you only have this without the other two, this is peace industry. This is peace industry. People just want to believe that if all three million Armenians from Armenia, or I don't know what's the uh, latest count, had count, if we all meet with uh, Turks and we find some ways to uh, uh, reconcile one on one, uh, it will influence uh, the top or somehow will uh, change the situation. 
You know, we've been observing this in many different conflicts. Cyprus, Israel, Palestine, it's not working. And it's, it shouldn't. Why should it? Uh, all Armenians meet all Turks, it will be only what percentage of the Turkish population? Maybe, maybe five percent. So there is an issue of scale, right? Uh, all Armenians have met uh, with uh, Turkish uh, counterparts at the grassroots level, all fine, we listen to music, we uh, uh, talk about everything but uh, the genocide. Uh, it all goes well, but it doesn't take us anywhere. It doesn't take us anywhere because without, back to Latin Iraq, uh, without um, these three, this one alone would not work. So why is this continuing then? Why this is happening? Why we are uh, kind of stuck here? Why we are not rethinking this approach? And what's missing? Why we would not have the vibrant uh, diplomacy that we all probably are craving for? What's, uh, what, are the, what are the major barriers to this? What are the major barriers? Anyone? To, uh, the major barriers to have a process that would uh, look like what uh, Lederach is prescribing. Like he's saying, you need all three. In our case, we don't even have, the, we don't have these two, so there is no diplomacy uh, active right now. Uh, I think Minister Nambanjan said that there is no uh, dialogue, no, nothing is going at this level. This level is very slim, and I'm asking, so what are the barriers? Yes, please. Let's say it loud, so I, at least I can hear, I will then uh, repeat it. Please. But what is the barrier? Why it's not happening? No, no, no. Let's uh, let's leave Turks uh, alone for a second. Okay, let's let them let them be where they are. I'm asking about us ourselves. What is the barrier? And we had several hands. There's one hand in the back. Please say loud so we can hear. The United States uh, needs to uh, see that Turkey. Turkey is not the only ally that he can uh, rely on. Maybe Armenia right. is another... Uh, but that's not the okay. answer to my yeah. question. I'm not asking what the United States should be doing. I'm asking what are the barriers. Right, please. Well, when you're talking about Afghanistan, first and foremost, I think Armenia should have the legitimacy and support of the domestic people. Oh, okay. All right. 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 Well, let me translate what I heard from you into the language, negotiation language. And what you're saying is you need to have an internal negotiation first and a legitimate kind of um, a process that would allow you then to negotiate external. So, and this is a very um, uh, well-known theme in, uh, for any uh, uh, students of negotiation. You have to negotiate internally before you engage externally. And negotiate internally, in our case, what that would mean. We have a nation that consists, at least in my part, my interpretation of it, is that it doesn't consist only of us uh, here in Armenia. It consists also of people who are in diaspora and in Arta. So we have, for, uh, we have this uh, triad. Right, really, uh, the nation is uh, not just here, it's, uh, it's this big uh, phenomenon that is spread all over the world. And what is missing for this uh, phenomenon of vibrant diplomacy, and for me probably, there are examples, we can go into that, but um, an obvious example is uh, how Israelis handle their issues, right, where they need national consensus, sufficient national consensus. Not everybody would agree to that. But most people would share the same uh, idea of what needs to happen. So what justice may look like to all of us. Uh, there may be still one hand going up saying I disagree with this. And it's okay, because we're talking about sufficient consensus. And this is the gap, this is a leadership gap. 
Uh, we, our leaders have not yet done that. The nation lacks sufficient consensus on one of the most critical issues. And it needs to happen. If it doesn't happen, any diplomats go out and engage in negotiations. The result, they do it secretly or they do it semi-transparently. They come back and there will be many people who will be saying it was a sellout. It was a sellout because the red lines are not drawn and we don't know what is it that we really want. We need to come to terms with that internally before we can have vibrant uh, diplomacy, creative diplomacy that will be negotiating, by the way, not just with Turkey, but with many other actors. There are many actors who can be involved in this process. Um, so that's one barrier, that's one way to look at this after uh, studying uh, some of these uh, approaches and theories. Uh, what I like to do with you now, because time is short, I want you to take to an exercise uh, that will be uh, using a tool very common for all diplomats. So, and that will probably show us again the difference between advocacy and diplomacy. So. Um, before we do that, the second man who influenced my thinking, uh, not only today, but the last 20 years, is uh, Roger Fisher, uh, professor, he was professor emeritus at law school, where um, Tom Samuelian studied, and uh, many other colleagues and friends of mine were students of his, um, including uh, President Obama, by the way. Uh, some of you, at least I see some familiar faces in this audience, know the model, uh, Fisher's model, and I'm not going to go into the details of this right now. Um, uh, I just uh, recommend that uh, whoever is interested pick up the book. It's been translated into Armenian too, and uh, and read the book. It's a very um, simple language uh, text written specifically that way, so that anyone can read it, anyone can understand this process. Because Roger believed we are negotiating constantly; we simply do not pay attention to the fact that it is negotiation. So if you are negotiating constantly, um, each time anyone is trying to uh, change my mind or I'm trying to change somebody's mind, um, I'm in process of uh, negotiation, they're in process of negotiation. Roger has argued that uh, you need these uh, three parts. You need to build a working relationship. You, have, you need to have trust. Uh, the parties need to trust each other. Uh, like uh, Rafi and uh, Serge Sarkisian, they need to build that trust. They need a very reliable and effective channel of communication so that uh, effective means what I'm saying to you, what my intention is behind this message, is interpreted by you the way I intended it. Right? And we had two men meet for an hour. I'm back to uh, uh, the president of the country and uh, Rafi Ovanisian. And you saw that they came out with uh, two very different stories out of that uh, meeting. So you need a very uh, reliable uh, channel of communication. Once you have these two, once you build working relationship and communication channel, you can work with the other side uh, on their interests. And I'm bringing back interests because remember we said Obama walks into the White House and that's where he's told we have national interests. So you have to understand what those national interests are. Uh, what is blocking his, uh, his yes. And maybe, maybe as someone was suggesting, asking him this year again to say genocide is waste of our very limited resources. And strategically, I'd say, maybe you can ask something else where you can get a yes. If you cannot change, and we'll, I'll take you through an exercise and it will show you how these disciplines you're thinking about, about the choice that the other side is making. And how that understanding then influences your own thinking about, is this the right move? Just like in chess. Is this the right way to continue? Or there are maybe other things that I need to get now that will be important for me on my way to my goal. So, I know your interests, you know my interests, we have some trust to work on. Next comes we design options. We see how many different options can be designed so that you leave the table satisfied and I leave the table uh, satisfied. My interests are well met. Sometimes uh, this method uh, is known as uh,
getting to yes by the book, but I must tell you that nothing can be further from the truth. The method is not about uh, getting to yes all the time. In fact, Roger has argued that very often you might need to be able to say no to the other side. No, because your alternatives, that is what you can do away from the table, what you can do without the other side, may be better than the options right now on the table. We've been working, we've been uh, negotiating, but we haven't developed options that satisfy my interests better than what I can do myself, or I can do without you. And only if we find options that uh, meet our interests better than our alternatives, and there are criteria. We talked about this uh, uh, criteria, right? What would be a criteria in our case? Uh, there's plenty of academic research into this. Uh, then we can say, yes, there is a commitment. That's a very simple model. Uh, th at this level, we are making the choice, and it has influenced many thinkers. It works um, even in situations of hostage crisis. Um, some of my uh, uh, colleagues have done work on hostage crisis, and I, uh, um, you know, the, the issue is, do you, can you really think very fast um, in, in a crisis to be using any uh, academic models? If you have internalized this, yes, you can. And some of us are doing this even intuitively. So in a hostage crisis, uh, most of you probably remember a uh, school in Russia, Beslan, uh, in uh, North Ossetia. The school was taken hostage, kids were taken hostage. There was one negotiator who walked into that school and he came out with 26 uh, children. So he managed to negotiate with terrorists and bring out 26 people. A question to you, what do you think he told them, why did they let these kids go? He said yes, rather than no. No, not exactly. So he walks in, imagine. Try to imagine that person walking into the, uh, into the room with Taris. Uh, someone is... Uh, I guess uh, he managed to uh, make them believe that his aims when entering the room are not something against their aims by keeping the children. So the, the, he's there just to help them, but he's nothing to do with their like goals or their aims. Right, so keeping these children, that's what uh, is being said, keeping these children is not, uh, is not in your interest somehow. Uh, that's what probably he said. Um, yeah, in fact, that's very close. He, he walks in there, there were over 900 children in that school. And he walks out with the infants, newly born ones, which, because it was uh, September 1st and some parents came with very uh, young children uh, to school. And he tells them, look, it's not in your interest to keep these kids, one-year-old, even two-year-old. Uh, they are crying, they are shouting, they are distracting you, and you cannot stop them doing that. You cannot stop them doing that. You can shout at someone who is a five or six year old and maybe he'd be scared to death and might not speak even uh, again. But you cannot do that with uh, uh, these young kids. So it's not in your interest, he says, to keep these kids here. He found very quickly where their interest is and that helped him negotiate in 12 minutes the release of uh, uh, 12 people. So I'm not here to tell you that this is the best thing since sliced bread. And this is the only way people should negotiate. People negotiate in many different ways. I'm observing now the negotiations, and as all of you are, between Rafi Hovhannisyan and uh, President Sarkisyan, and that's also negotiation. And we can see what is being used by the side. We can analyze, we can be very uh, analytical about uh, where they stand, how this, is, this might end by some of the symptoms. But my goal today is not to analyze that. My goal is to use one of the tools that Roger Fisher designed to work with you on this, um, on this no issue. Um, one of the uh, things that distinguishes uh, this model from any other models is that it was uh, designed on a notion that you cannot have them have it your way if you are not thinking about their interest too. So you need to come to some kind of a solution at the table where they are not going to say no to you. They're not going to say, I myself can do better. Thank you. I with other parties can do better. 
you have to put an option on the table that meets your interests, but it should meet also the interests of the other side. Otherwise, Roger argued very rationally, why should they say yes to you? Unless you are somehow manipulating them, uh, and that in a long-term relationship will be very, very negative and damaging for the relationship, and you won't be able to negotiate this way anymore. So why would you uh, think that if the option is not meeting their interests, they somehow would say yes to you? They won't. So this requires very creative thinking, and the model allows this to do, because before we get to this uh, decision-making, here we can look into so many different options. Many options. I'm not committing to any one of those. I'm just looking into how that meets my interest and meets your interest. Um, so I'm not going to go again, as I said, to the uh, very politicized uh, negotiation that goes on right now. I want to go with you into this exercise because the tool itself probably speaks uh, better about the uh, difference in uh, advocacy and diplomacy than anything else. So uh, the uh, concept that you need to have in mind when you're using something like this is empathy. It's very important. Empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is my ability to put myself in the other side's shoes and think the way they are thinking and see the choice the way they are thinking, they are perceiving right now. Um, and sometimes very difficult for people to do that. Uh, I have a hope. If we have uh, this many chess players in this country, we should be able to think empathetically. Because a chess player does that. He has to think the way the other side will be thinking, right? That's what they do. You, otherwise, you cannot be successful in that game. The same in uh, negotiation. You always need to think, what will be their move? If I do this, if I say this, how this will play out? How are we going to uh, find a solution with them if I'm doing this? Um, so, empathy uh, uh, is uh, one thing that is taught almost at any diplomatic school. Diplomats know that. Here is position one. This is how we see the situation. Our side sees the situation this way. This is position two. This is how they see the situation. And this is position three. I'm looking at it from the balcony. Remember Einstein saying, uh, I'm looking... Uh, from a distance, what's going on? Uh, we're not going to practice uh, the third one, but position one, position two, quickly, it's very important. And if I'm going to position two, it doesn't mean that I'm going to agree with them. It doesn't mean that I have to accept the way they think. I only need to understand the way they think, because if I don't understand the way they think, I won't be able to change that. So, it, it is the challenge, for any negotiator uh, to do that. If I'm trying to understand how you think, it doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you. I won't be able to change your mind if I don't do that. So uh, we'll uh, start this exercise now. I'll explain to you, the tool is very simple. It's known as uh, currently perceived choice. That is, how they perceive the choice now uh, and the first part is understanding how they think. We won't get, uh, time is short, we won't get to the second part, which is how do we go about now changing that? Is it possible to change that now? First, understand it. And let's try to do that. I'll only indicate how we work on changing that then, right? Because that's going to be very important um, for strategic thinking about, do I need to continue again after one no from this side to demand that they uh, uh, say yes to me? Or maybe, Maybe I need to leave that for advocacy and diplomacy needs to work on some other uh, pieces and get something else, strategically more important probably now, uh, for the country. Because if we only work on this uh, yes and we're getting a no and other interests of ours are not met, it means that we're not getting where we need to be. It's a failure. You need to be strategic about what you, what you do. So, as I said, it's very simple. Choose a decision maker. It has to be a person. You can't be saying United States. You can't be saying uh, France or some country. It has to be a person. And there is a reason for that, because when you limit it to person, it's easier to analyze. 
there may be many different uh, uh, takes in, uh, in a country, many different uh, interests, but it's very important to define uh, the decision-maker. So first, it's the decision-maker. Once you wrote here who the decision-maker is, the second is, this is the tricky part. It's not what I'm asking them, it's how they hear what I'm asking them. Right? I'm asking them to recognize the genocide, and they hear it slightly differently. I need to put myself in their shoes and to produce how they hear it now. Okay, uh, do you have any suggestions for the exercise? By the way, there are many uh, probably parties who are saying no to us. It should be difficult from some ways to, uh, uh, to choose, but from another, we can continue with Obama if you want, or we can do something else. Any, any suggestions, objections? Can we write here uh, President Obama? Is that fine? Would be interesting as an exercise because I want you to uh, engage in this. All right, so it will be pre decision making President Obama. We approach, we is, I don't know, some lobbying organizations, advocacy groups, Armenian groups. They approach him uh, and they're asking him, would you recognize formally the Armenian genocide and use the genocide word on April 24th, 2013? And he's hearing it very it differently from him. How he might be hearing it? Anyone wants to try to put himself in the shoes of Obama? We had two hands go up. Uh, please, and then we'll hear it. He hears it in a different way, maybe he may, I'm guessing. Uh, yes, we're all guessing. Yeah, right. I'm for, yeah. okay, I'm first. Uh, he's, he thinks, why these people believe that Armenian national interests are above American national interests? Or something like that. Right, any other takes on this? Anyone who can really put himself or herself in the shoes of uh, Obama. Uh, do I want any problems with Turkey? Okay. Okay. All right, Tom. They want me to accuse Turkey of genocide? Are they real? Okay. Yes. And I like that because you need to think almost the way the other person is thinking. And right now, when he's saying no to us, he's thinking very negatively about it. There has to be some negativism. And we'll put it in a, a quotation mark. Uh, I like that. It's uh, getting very close how he says, what words he uses. So if I'm Rafi Hovanisian negotiating with uh, Ser Sarkisian and I'm asking him to do something and he's saying no to me, I need to put myself in his shoes and almost be able to talk the way he talks. Right? Because that is empathy. And empathy, again, it doesn't mean that I agree with him. I just want to understand the way he thinks. All right, so uh, we put it up. It's President Obama. The question is, uh, that's very neutral, uh, Stefan. Will you recognize the Armenian genocide? He, and I want that in quotation marks, uh, much stronger word. I, I guess it should be something like that. Probably it won't be exactly the way it is. It's uh, approximation, assumption. But uh, I think we can get very close to it, especially given that he's saying no. No means negative. There's got to be some negative. And we should sometimes say, should I now recognize the Turkish genocide against Armenians? Are they real? Meaning, they don't understand, right? They don't understand something. They don't understand uh, uh, my choice, my dilemma. And once you have done this, uh, next is um, you continue to work as if you were President Obama. So we now all will be President Obama. We are all thinking the way he thinks. And he thinks that there are consequences. If he says yes, there are consequences. And if he says no, there are consequences. And right now, he sees more positive things happening from his no than from his yes. Obvious. If he's rational, he should be. Uh, he's looking at this uh, uh, table in his mind, 
maybe it doesn't look like this uh, exactly, but there are consequences from yes and consequences from no. Let's do it, but we are not doing this as uh, individuals gathered here. We are all now President Obama's, the way Obama thinks about it. And I think maybe there are enough people who may get close to that thinking in this uh, audience, and that's why I want to uh, engage you in this exercise. So, um, if yes, if I say yes, what's going to happen? And one by one, uh, please. <laughs> if I say yes, uh, my nation will accuse me of um, getting mixed in, involved with another uh, international dispute that we have nothing to do with. We're already involved in too many international disputes or wars. Okay, so I... If I say yes, we're getting into, oh, don't make it too long, make it short, we're getting ourselves into some trouble that we don't want, somewhere, somewhere out there. Right? That's what I'm hearing? Okay, close. Uh, please. Uh, will damage relationship with Turkey. Right. This will damage our relations with Turkey, if I say yes. This will damage our relations with our ally Turkey. Uh, our very important strategically ally Turkey, it will damage what else? I just would like to add uh, to this sentence that Turkey, which is much more important partner in the region rather than our... Right, so we will damage uh, our relationship with a more important ally, uh, Turkey, than Armenia. Please. It will damage our um, military and geopolitical uh, interests. Okay, anything else? Yeah, but if I, if I say yes, there is a positive outcome. All Armenians will rejoice and I will be the most loved president by Armenians as Clinton was by Albanians in Kosovo because uh, there were even kids born named Clinton in, uh, in uh, Kosovo. Okay. So there will be, Armenians will be naming their kids after me. It's a positive outcome. <laughs> Assuming you think that way. All right. Uh, it's, uh, it's very common when we do this exercise, uh, sometimes people get into this mode, oh, this is not like him, he's not thinking that way. Right now I want you to suspend your judgment. We will write it. We will be able then to correct it. We will be able to think uh, uh, through this. Okay, so there might be something positive. I take a moral stance. I look uh, good not just to Armenians but to, uh, uh, to the entire world uh, because I stood on values, right, uh, which is uh, maybe, uh, maybe important for you. Well, we, that's an assumption right now. Anybody else? What else might be? Yes. It might be useful to have leverage over, to have leverage over Turkey by um, mm -hmm. recognizing it and demanding um, certain kinds of concessions. It's actually losing leverage. Uh, it can be both ways. It can be a leverage over Turkey. I recognize the genocide and I'm putting pressure on them, right, on Turkey, because they may now see what's his next move. Maybe if he recognizes the genocide, next he's going to um, demand something or put more pressure on us internationally. Um, okay, possible. What else? What else? It's hard to be President Obama. It's obvious. It's, uh... We'll not vote for him. Yes, luckily they're, they're not voting for him yet. Uh, uh, I, I, you mean in Turk oh, Turkish Americans, the community in there? Maybe a concern. Of, yes. Okay, so he's thinking if I say yes, what will happen? What will be the consequence? Okay. All right, but I like, I heard something else here. Uh, there is, and I think that's important. Uh, I might lose uh, the support of the 
uh, Jewish community here, yeah. right? Possible? <laughs> yes, it's very dynamic. It's very dynamic, and that's what makes diplomacy difficult, right? We think, oh, they have a bad relationship, and it turns out um, just like that, it's changing now. Again, changing. So you, that's why you have to keep an eye on this. Okay, anybody else? Yes. So if you look at the magnitude of domestic resources that could be mobilized against the decision, if he says yes, well, let's start. If he says no, if I say yes, you are Obama. Okay. If, yeah, if I say if I President. say no, um, a few hundred thousand dollars of Armenian lobbyist money will be rallied against my decision. If I say yes, a few tens of millions or maybe hundred of million dollars of Turkish AI pack uh, ADL money will be rallied against my decision. Okay. So I may get more resistance if I say yes from these lobbies than if I were to say no. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> you also open uh, a precedent for the issues of genocide recognition for other genocides committed, namely in the United States territories against Native Americans. Okay, maybe, yes. Uh, I'm setting a precedent, of course. Okay, I'm recognizing the genocide of Armenians, and I have my own constituencies here who might be uh, demanding the same. Oh, we're getting more active people now, uh, and there is only one microphone. Uh, so, there is more. And I need someone to help me uh, with the mic. Okay. Uh, you may be concerned over Armenian-Turkish relationship uh, as they often cited uh, that they, they would get worse. Armenian-Turkish relationship. Or if I say On yes, level, if I say yes, I the Turkish-Armenian relationship will get worse. Say more about it. Yeah, because they always cited uh, when they refuse to to recognize the genocide, um, all the. Uh, officers of, and uh, in the United States, they, they said this this question, this sentence, like uh, the, the relationship between Armenian and uh, Turkish societies will get worse, and uh, that it would harm uh, the building uh, peace between them. So you you're saying that Obama might be trapped in the thinking. Remember, I was saying, let them go through reconciliation first. Otherwise, if I do recognize, there won't be a reconciliation. He's trapped in that thinking, you? Yeah. That's, uh, that's what I'm hearing? So let them first reconcile, and then there will be recognition. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting um, assumption if he's thinking that way. He's trapped in that. Uh, okay, uh, but um, let, let's put it up, because uh, it may be, when you work on how to change this, it may be uh, an easy one to change, uh, the way I think about it. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is one more responsibility that the United States may uh, take on this. That's the court of the history uh, responsibility. I mean, how come that the United States uh, in 1915 and 1920 uh, did not, w was not active enough to help Armenians oh. to avoid the genocide? And there is a responsibility there. Right. Okay, so for a second, I just want to stop this for a second because this is what happens uh, in this exercise. We sometimes forget that we are in the mode of empathy. We are now thinking the way Obama thinks. Not the way we think Obama thinks, but the way Obama actually thinks. And if we think he thinks, um, there is U.S. responsibility, U.S. historical responsibility for genocide prevention. Mm, or we want him to think that way. Or does he think that way? Uh, I don't know. I'm not saying that you are not right. I'm just saying we have to be very clear uh, when we do this. Is this um, him thinking that way? U.S. historical responsibility for genocide prevention. Do we have to know about that. He if has he to thinks... know about that. Yeah. We want him to know about that. But does he? Uh, okay. Uh, one. <coughs> are in good relations with Turkey. 
Oh, okay. So uh, let's, uh, uh, if yes, let's look how others have said that yes and preserve the uh, relationship with uh, Turkey still. Um, you see, again, I think uh, we're getting into this uh, wishful thinking mode. We wish he were thinking that way. Uh, I'm not saying it's not happening, by the way. I don't know. But uh, not expert enough on Obama to say that. Uh, but I just warn you uh, about the most common mistakes made in this exercise, in the thinking exercise. You have to uh, know the other side well to be able to put yourself in uh, their shoes. And we are now uh, President Obama. We're thinking about consequences of yes and no. Anybody else? Oh, Tom, do you I want to deal with the backlash in the State Department, in the Pentagon, and among uh, U.S. military, U.S. Uh, military, uh, whatever armaments, cells, and so forth. Right. So I'm going to get problems, or very likely. I mean, I'm saying this might be likely. I'm going to be. I'm going to have problems with uh, State Department, Pentagon, military-industrial complex, uh, and a number of other players in the United States who may not like what I'm doing. Plausible, right? I mean, very rational, much more plausible. It was you again. Uh, you are somehow from behind, and I, I might be missing you. So why don't you uh, sit up front? It will be. Um, how how would I deal with the fallout that would happen in Congress from Turkish act? The legislation initiative, i.e., if I need votes for health care reform by Bob. Jackson, who supports Turkey and is on the fence on this, how but there is also an American uh, Armenian caucus. He could the same way think, I'm going to deal with these guys if I'm, I'm saying uh, no. No? Uh, yeah, it's, it's all about numbers, knowing the numbers. And he, his advisors are probably putting those numbers on the table for him. So what's, uh, and then uh, I'm not saying it's so impossible. I'm saying something is more plausible and something is probable, more probable than something else. Uh, please. Ah, okay. So we might have problems not just with um, uh, Turkey, but Azerbaijan. Might be, why not? Because it's important. We have Iran and all sorts of uh, consideration. It doesn't make any sense now to get another uh, regional opponent to our actions in the region, okay? Uh, yeah, let's, let's do a little bit more on the no side. Uh, you're getting what we're doing, right? I mean, I, my purpose is not to solve it tonight. I just want you to take an instrument, a thinking instrument, that helps discipline the way you approach uh, uh, the problem. Okay, so uh, let's get to the no side. If I say no, what's going to happen? Uh, here is one important uh, piece when you do this. Some pieces from this side can move to this side with a different sign, right? So, uh, accused of involvement in another international issue. If I say no, I am not accused of involvement in another uh, uh, international issue. I'm just giving you an example of how this can uh, move from here. And that's positive, by the way. If I say no, it's a positive. I'm not accused of involving in another international dispute. Assuming that uh, he's thinking again. Uh, so uh, it's very important that we put these pluses and minuses on both sides because that when uh, we'll start to think on how is it possible to change this? Is it possible to do so that he hears this question differently and chooses a yes? Uh, this will come very handy. So we are in a no mode. If I say no, and uh, normally, a uh, person thinking about uh, this choice um, sees more pluses from a no. If I say no, many good things will happen. What will happen? I'm President Obama. Uh, I'll have more time. I can always say uh, yes uh, later. Something like that. Uh, yeah, I may say I may say yes later. Why? I mean, I'm not in a rush. Uh, I can always say yes later. All right. 
What? Yeah, I'm not introducing um, uh, no means no changes uh, to the um, uh, geopolitical configuration. Yes, please, you want to say. Uh, we have leverage over on the yes side as a positive, leverage over Turkey. I think it's actually more on the no side because if he continues to kick the can down the road, Turkey continues to be afraid of what if America recognizes it. And therefore, if he always keeps that genocide issue hold, hanging over Turkey, it works to America's benefit. Uh, somehow don't see it. Uh, uh, leverage of Turkey is on the left. Right, so we have this. So and if you continue to keep that as a thing hanging over Turkey's head by not recognizing it but leaving it open, maybe I will one day, you can continue to get things out of Turkey by saying if you don't stay in line, we will recognize it. So if I say no, I'm losing that leverage, right? Yes. If I say no, but I lose the leverage. And more to right. calculate, more to, you know. If I say no, there is no headache. Plus, wait, I'm kind of trying. There is no headache. Last year there was none. Um, and uh, well, why not? I mean, I, I, I can say no without any negative consequences. No headache. Uh, predictable. Like fear right. of the and unknown. It stays uh, static, right? I'm not changing much in my second term as a president. All right, anybody else? I'm interested mostly in this no part. Yes. Maybe if I, uh, if I say no, I will reduce my country's reputation as my country is democratic and the protection of human rights is on the top. Okay. Um, if I say no, and it's a negative consequence for him, right? Uh, Stefan, it's a negative consequence. Right. All right, anybody else on no side? Yeah. I will be change the background from which we construct all these uh, things. I think the genocide is a crime. Right. So let us construct uh, uh, following uh, points from uh, this point of view. Right. That would be advocacy. Because to right. take the diplomacy is a, is a trap for me. Right, right. I, I understand the point. And people who are in advocacy mode right now, they say, we don't want a diplomacy. Diplomacy is bad. Something bad might happen if we try diplomacy. Right. Let's stay in advocacy. We know that we are right. We know that genocide happened, and let's construct, continue to construct that position, and go and hammer everybody with that position. Is, I'm exaggerating, or it's yes. close? My own uh, point of view is uh, all this process is a trap. Is a trap. It's, it's a good thing to do, but we have to think about the crime issue also. Oh, uh, and I started with this. By the way, I'm not saying we should not be doing advocacy. It's like having two arms. You only need to know when you're using advocacy and when you're using diplomacy. And these need to be coordinated well enough so that you get what you want with two different, very different tools. So it's not, I'm not saying, forget about advocacy, let's get only diplomacy in place. You need both, and we'll get to it. I mean, because even if I'm in advocacy, I may get some insights from this kind of exercise. Maybe my advocacy needs to be restructured somewhere. Because um, uh, it's also resources, right? It's all about resources, strategically resources that you're using. Please. Um, if I say no, no one's going to notice. Mm, yeah, no consequences, no, uh, no headache. Okay, right? What else? Yes, Mr. President. If I say no, then I will probably damage my reputation and legacy as a president who did not honor his pledge as a candidate. Right, so it's a moral issue for him, right? Moral. I, I will be uh, remembered as a flip-flopper on another issue. Right? I, uh, I didn't, uh, it's, it's negative. Uh, what else? Uh, one in the back and then I'll come to you. Please. Relations with Turkey will strengthen uh, my, uh, will help me in furthering my aims in the Middle East to Turkey. By right. Turkey. If I say no, if I say no, my uh, relations with Turkey will be uh, good enough so that I can uh, uh, play a role of a mediator between them and Israel, for instance. I can. Uh, I have lots of things to do with uh, uh, Turks and Israelis in the Middle East. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, so we have this in the yes 
side somewhere. I cannot see it right now, but it, 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 it comes here with a, a plus, right? I'm getting, uh, if I say no, this is a positive consequence for me. I'll take two more, uh, two or three more, because as I said, uh, hold just a second, I'll come to you. Another positive consequence for the USA can be that if I say no, nothing would happen, because nothing happened during the last five years. Yeah, we already have that. Um, thank you. Unless it's something different, something new. Uh, Obama might be thinking if uh, he. No, said... no, no. This is not the right way to start, by the way. Okay. Obama might be thinking is not right. You are, okay. Mr. Uh, President. You are Obama. Well, if I say no to Armenians, I'm saying no to the uh, allied Russians. So I'm preventing the case that uh, Russia can get this from it. Oh, okay. So if I say no. I'm saying no to the allies of the Russians. Okay, so Armenia is an ally to, uh, with Russia, and therefore they deserve no. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, close. Okay. Maybe, I don't know. And, and here is, um, uh, someone was talking about traps, and in thinking, there are always traps. One of the traps here is that we don't know for sure how President Obama is thinking. Right? These are all assumptions. So what does a good diplomat do with these assumptions? Check. What is the process next? Next thing to do? Verification, exactly. He says, okay, can we start talking to the administration? Can we check with them if this is really something that he's thinking right now? If this is really important for them? Right? So you are trying as a negotiator, you are always trying to work against the asymmetry of information. Right? There is a symmetry of information. These are all assumptions. We don't know for sure. If you go with this as conclusions, you are trapped. You are trapped. But you may not be able to verify all of those. Right? What you do next is you try to see how many pluses and minuses and which ones of these are most heavy ones. Right? They, they, they have very different weight here. Uh, obviously, uh, there are some pluses from yes. We uh, collectively put some pluses from yes here. But as you can see, there are many minuses. Many minuses in this column. And there are some pluses, many pluses from no, and some minuses here. So when you use this tool, next level, is to think which ones are most important ones for that, for that person who's making this decision. So then I go into verification and I say this is no longer assumption. In fact, uh, this, this is true. Lose Turkish electorate. I don't know if that's an important one. So this is how you think about important issues for them, important interests for them. Right? They, we here have some interests. These are interests, the way they are perceived by the Obama administration today. How do you do verification? How do you do verification? A good question. Any diplomat, anybody studies diplomacy in this audience? We have. So how do you do that? Yeah, how do I verify? I have this as an assumption and I need to verify it. So how do I do that? No, you talk to them. You go and meet with them. You invite them. You engage them informally. You sit down with many people. You sit and talk and you try to get, well, you can call this intelligence. But for me, it's important that you have the data that either verifies or disproves this. And there still might be a mistake, even after you've done all that. Still might be a mistake. But you are closer to getting... Pardon? Oh, Paul Assange, okay. <coughs> call Assange, we can call Assange, okay. Uh, we, we, Wikileaks, right, uh, that will be uh, another thing. So, yeah, and uh, no, I'm not going to go into the, um, uh, the diplomatic process of how diplomats do that. But all I'm saying is, once you got into this, it's, um, uh, you are halfway through. You already understand which ones of these 
after you rank them and verify and rank them and you say, well, let's assume uh, you are doing the second part right now, you are ranking. Which ones of these are most important, do you think? Put yourself not uh, as an uh, uh, Armenian audience here, but as Obama now, looking at this, you say, which ones are the most important ones? Here, of yeses, the, the yeah. heaviest ones. Oil. Uh, uh, you will be arguing uh, till morning Looking today to if I world. let you do this. So we're not going to go that way. You just say your opinion and we're not going to argue. We will just uh, listen to what you have to say. Yes, which one? The second one, damage relations with... Damage relations with um, most important uh, ally Turkey. Uh, okay, so uh, I would... Well, you can do all sorts of different uh, uh, scales and rank this very differently, right? You want to understand what's more important for, uh, for Obama. <laughs> and once you've done it, once you've chosen several of these, you may look at this and say, do I have the resources to change this? How would I work, what would I need to do for him to see this differently? How would I need to work with him so that this plus leverage over Turkey becomes more important than other things, for instance. Because I want the pluses in this column to be heavy. And I want some of the minuses to be, uh, if possible, even eliminated from this uh, list, if possible. And how, how would you do that? What would you need to do to change some of these perceptions? These are perceptions. Right? So what would need to happen? There are things that you can do, and there are things that are beyond your control. You can say, uh, for instance, I'm uh, going here, um, right, I have, uh, where is the uh, uh, flip flop in president? Yeah, I don't see uh, uh, the uh, military industrial complex. Or... Oh, okay, backwards from power. Oh, in the yes call, they didn't translate here. Okay, so um, if, if I'm thinking about that one, can I really change that? Can we really change that as a nation? Probably not. And it will stay there. I don't know. Then I will be asking myself a question. What would need to happen, right? And I'm observing things might be changing fast. And if I see that that is changing, that also informs my uh, decisions. But I know now what are the things that I can change. I have the resources that I can commit to change. I can create options to help Americans see and President Obama see this differently. Or I don't. And I don't is also an answer. If I don't, I simply shelve this. I come and open it and I revisit it. Uh, something important happens, some big changes. So it's, has something changed here? But if I look at this and I say, uh, right now I cannot change. He will be saying no to me. I understand why he's saying no to me. What shall we do? Shall we continue to ask for meetings with him and say, we have come, President Obama? To wait, to wait. Let's let's uh, shelf it and, and wait. But I want to see if um, if there's going to be a a change. What what would need to happen? Oh, so we need to wait, or shall we go and knock on his door? It's uh, it's March now, April twenty fourth, and say, will you say this? Right. So if I understand that it's going to be a no. I might say, I go to him with uh, different things. I will go and ask other things that I've analyzed and I can see it's easier for him to say yes. And I will say to him, Mr. President, I understand that you have hard constraints. That I understand why you cannot say no. Uh, I think I understand why you are saying no to me because I see these consequences from yes, negative yes. And yet, there are things that you probably can do. And what are those? And you have to go back to your national interests 
You have to look at the options that strategically will help you step by step, as you said, move in the right direction. Because if I were to review what happened, uh, if I were to review what has happened in the last couple of years, I only see missed opportunities. So if he's not saying yes to us, we will mobilize protests, we will tell him that we are not voting for him, and we will uh, probably, uh, probably will uh, uh, not go and talk to him anymore. And probably they won't want to talk to us anymore. Because uh, they lost face, there is no way for us to do some face saving, and maybe it's uh, just, uh, what, what is it that Armenians are going to say? They're going to come and say, please, recognize the genocide, that we know what they're going to say. Say it again. It becomes a ritual, right? So it's a ritual. We go, we get a no, we get angry, uh, we vent, and nothing changes. Okay? Well, the reason why you're assuming that you can't actually change the status quo is because you're only taking into consideration advocacy and diplomacy. But there are other ways of actually coercing states governments to do things such as I knew that was coming. Um, yeah, well, you may or you may not. Or you may get even uh, worse things. May. Uh, and, and since you touched on this one, if you look at how our history, and there are people here in this audience who know this better than I do, our history, the evolution of our history, of our response to this, right, the immediate response to the genocide was uh, what? Was revenge, right? It was revenge, and it's understandable. You're in pain, you don't get the justice, and, and you get people who were ready to, to revenge. And then we have a hiatus, and then we have people who say, we'll go back, we'll bring the issue back by terrorism, right? Uh, and obviously, I think it didn't work quite the way they were hoping, or you think it did. Right, right. So. Uh, it brought awareness and probably many, uh, could be many bad consequences. Especially given now that we have a state of Armenia, and you don't want to have a state sponsoring terrorism, for whatever good causes that is. Um, all right, yes, please. Is that a comment? Are we moving now to a general comments, or are we still with the tool? Uh, I'm for the third... Oh, you want to argue against yeah, terrorism? No, I think uh, we'll leave it out. Okay, argue. that's Just that's fine. Support, um, not argue. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, maybe there are many other tools, uh, but uh, we are looking now into advocacy and diplomacy. And I want to say again, I'm not here to say advocacy is bad per se, that we should stop doing it. We should understand where it's most effective. And what are we getting with advocacy? And what kind of advocacy we need to advance uh, our causes? And uh, where diplomacy should be more effective. And I think Diplomacy can be more effective than it has been. Again, not evaluation of uh, foreign policy of Armenia in the last 20 years. I hope someone will write an academic text evaluating what has happened and what opportunities have been missed in 20 years. We don't have anything like that, right? I haven't seen uh, anyway. Uh, but the point is not criticizing or looking into what opportunities were missed. The point is understanding where the most important barrier is. And in my mind, I'm just sharing this with you, I didn't come to uh, give you a prescription. But from seeing how others have been successful in this, the most uh, critical barrier in my mind is the lack of that very consensus. Where we don't know, on a national level, on a sufficient consensus on what do we want. And then there can be a discourse on how people want to get what we want, and there may be differences of opinion, and maybe some people will be saying terrorism, I hope the majority won't take that seriously. Uh, uh, and if we do choose, we will be still choosing from the two, advocacy and diplomacy. Uh, because I cannot see, I mean, if, you, if we're talking about uh, the genocide issue in general, there are probably uh, three approaches to this. Right? How can we get all of it done, uh, maybe by war? Maybe by war, you, uh, you get lands back by war. That's been, that's been happening historically. Uh, you can wait for the enlightenment to kick in. So we have more uh, Jamal Pasha uh, grandsons and others who will be coming with the recognition, 
you continue to work on uh, track three, uh, kick in to track two or track one and a half, and waiting until uh, Turkey will come to a different position. And the third one is negotiation. And negotiation is not just directly with Turkey, again, because our issue is not just with Turkey on the other side. It's negotiating with multiple players. And if it's negotiation, then we need to think differently about the way we were thinking about this uh, dilemma. So what needs to happen for diplomacy to be at the level that we need it? How can it be done? What, is the, uh, what are the tools that um, our diplomats uh, need to use more to be more eff effective? How can they be more creative about designing some of the uh, options in persuading uh, various parties? I have, uh, I see many hands, and that means people have comments or questions. Uh, I think we have uh, time for some questions. We started a little bit late, can we take uh, uh, back 10 minutes that uh, we wasted in the beginning? Yeah. All right, so we have 10 minutes, and I'll take questions. Uh, but please, if, or if it's a comment, keep it very short. Uh, questions, I can take questions. Please, you have a microphone. It's not a question, it's a comment. Can't Please. you question his morals and put him in the spotlight instead of getting mad and asking asking him to recognize the genocide? Can't you question his integrity and morals? I think that has been done. I may not know the specifics of it. I think that has been done. And when you do that, uh, people normally lose face. Right? I mean, all of a sudden, you can call him a flip-flopper. You can say... you. See, you were, you were, as a senator, recognizing this, now you don't, um, and he will feel bad about it. But will he change his mind? Uh, will he change his mind because of that? Well, some, some people think yes, some people say no. In most cases, uh, it's a no. Because in politics, in politics, unfortunately, uh, people tend to put uh, interest above Moral, and that's unfortunate. But then that's the world that we live in—that's the realism. Pardon? Is there a enough awareness? If, people say it's, it's like if, uh, if yes, if CNN starts its morning program by saying President Obama, by the way, forgot to recognize the genocide <laughs> every day, maybe I don't know, but it's not happening that way—not not yet. Uh, please, questions? Yes. Yes, please, questions. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Question. Uh, well, well, I guess when it comes to qu uh, try and phrase a comment as a question, uh, do you see it as, say, we never really got to the, I guess maybe the core of it is, how do we make Obama see it in his interests and the United States' interests to recognize the genocide or right. do something in Armenia's interest? I think... You know, at this point, trying to just beat the dead horse of Obama, say genocide, that hasn't happened and it probably won't. But if we had a consensus like you're talking about, that perhaps our goal is, okay, get the border, the blockade opened and Armenia have certain rights to the Black Sea or, or things along those lines, we could make it Obama see that is in the United States' interest to end the blockade because that right. releases Armenia's reliance on Russia, which, are, yeah. which is in the U.S.'s interest. Yeah. I uh, cannot answer to the substance of the question because that uh, is really the work of uh, uh, diplomacy, think tanks, uh, and they come up with a list of national interests. Uh, normally, and the process that I've seen in the United States, you put some of the vital national interests, they are red, red chips, and then, then you have less important ones, blue, and the least important ones are green. And the question is, can I go with some of the red chip national interests to President Obama and say, exactly as you framed it, I don't know whether that's uh, uh, opening to the Black Sea or what is it that we are putting on the table, what option we're putting on the table that would meet our uh, red chip national interests. That should be the process, right? Instead of saying, oh, he said no, there's not much to talk to him about. How can I talk to someone who's uh, flip-flopping like that? And that's not working. That's where you need diplomacy to kick in and to get what you can get. All right, please. Okay. Okay, that's 
a question for three talks in this series. Um, um, we can start it now, uh, of course, but uh, I think it's a, it's a big question. Uh, if you're asking me and you're tying it to um, uh, uh, 2015, I'm not a strong believer in, uh, in, sim uh, in symbolism of, uh, of years. Right? And I, I mean, someone will have to uh, show me what's going to be different in 2015 from where we are today, that things will change uh, dramatically. So, or, or, or you're saying that there is this symbolism and people want to hear more about it, we do not need to use the opportunity to stress it. Why the stage to act? It's an opportunity. And I think, yes, we should be, uh, but we should not have the expectation, that's my answer. And we should not have an expectation that somehow, miraculously, uh, 2015 is going to be the year of uh, recognition by uh, Turkey, unless we do something in the, uh, in the uh, two years that are left. And I think, uh, well, I mean, there are things that are happening. Uh, there are things that are done by various uh, groups. And this brings me uh, to another issue that we have. Not only we are somehow engaged in this uh, uh, peace industry, but we are also fragmented on the issue, which is a very big challenge. Right? There is no, I mean, maybe there is some coordination that I don't know of, but um, it's, it's very fragmented right now. And many people have thought about many different way, uh, ways of uh, 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 getting to that uh, uh, tragic date in uh, in our history, a uh, hundred years, uh, some people have been talking about uh, uh, movies, you've heard about it, some people have been talking about books or more uh, uh, events and things, conferences and whatnot. I think that um, the, best, uh, the best answer to uh, 2015 would be if today our leaders were to turn to this issue of building this consensus. And if by 200, 2015, we as a nation could say, our sufficient consensus is this. This is in our national interest. This is what we want. This is why it's fair, criteria. And this is how we go as a nation after that. That would be, I think, the best statement of it, in my view. I don't know how others see this, because I'm looking into not just process for the sake of the process, I'm looking into how we are removing barriers in that process that will help us uh, work more focused on, on the issues uh, that concern us. Uh, and, and if you're asking me for practical things, uh, I think we need to sit down. I have some things in mind, but I don't think it's uh, appropriate for this uh, uh, to use this time to uh, discuss the, that issue. All right, please. Not on terrorism again, please. <laughs> First one is, why is it so important for President Obama to recognize the genocide if we've already had Ronald Reagan recognize the genocide and nothing has actually changed? And my second question is, in order to actually engage in diplomatic negotiations, you need to have leverage. And what does Armenia have? Churches, apricot, chess players? Uh, uh, there's, in order to actually negotiate, you need to have leverage. And Two uh, very important things. Uh, a, we didn't do this exercise. This was just an exercise. I didn't uh, imply that we're going to go now and start working on changing uh, President Obama's mind. We just wanted to see how the tool is used. It can be anybody else there, right? It's just an exercise. Uh, and you may be right. Do we need Obama to say it if we have Reagan and many others who have already recognized? I don't know. I'm not going in that direction. On the issue of power, and, and you are uh, in the realist paradigm, power does matter. And there is uh, hard power, there is soft power. And as you were enumerating Armenia's power, I was hearing more on the soft side of things, right? The chess players, apricots, and uh, uh, whatever else you mentioned. And we, you, do, we do not have hard power. And you're asking me, how do you negotiate? So it's a very important question for any negotiator. There is a symmetry of power. I go out to negotiate. I am the weak side. I don't have enough uh, leverage, as you were saying, or I don't have enough power military or otherwise, you know, hard power, how do I negotiate? I think the uh, uh, most uh, simple answer to that question is you do that through building coalitions. 
you build coalitions. You try to uh, leverage and get the breakthrough where you can. You analyze uh, uh, the whole game and you find a way where the uh, coalition will help you uh, get the breakthrough in a critical point. But it doesn't mean that you have to give up and say, oh, we are weak, what can we do? We cannot negotiate. On the contrary, I think that Armenia uh, can negotiate and Armenia can be in the process by, again, using different coalitions, building uh, maybe uh, coalitions that will be not uh, forever, but on that particular issue, uh, so that we are negotiating and getting what we need to get. Um, easier said than done, but I assure you that even very weak country like Iceland, uh, in military terms and military power, was able to stand against mighty Britain. The cod was. Fish cod, cod was. It's history. It's, it happened. And they did that through coalitions. They were able to do that. And if they were able to do that, and many others were able to do that, we should be able to, if we manage to get ahead in the thinking game. And that's, uh, that's what we are doing here. We are, we are a nation of thinkers and we need to be thinking creatively about these things. All right, I'll take one more and we'll close. Yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a lady. Yeah? You have a uh, my question is about, let's say he said yes, uh, are we ready to deal with the consequences and our demands? Okay, yeah, it's a good question about unintended consequences, it happens. Um, so, uh, you, you wanted this yes, and then he says yes, you don't, don't know what to do with that. Uh, happens, I'm not speaking about Obama, I'm speaking in general, happens that way too. Uh, we assuming, again, for the purpose of this exercise, that getting that yes from Obama is important for us. Right? But as some of the uh, uh, participants here were saying, maybe it is not. Maybe we should be asking for something else. Maybe we should be getting something else that will help us step by step with small pieces build what we need uh, and get what we need. And uh, build that power that we, we are lacking right now. Uh, yes. In addition to the importance that you said we should attach to each one of these points, these pluses and minuses, there's also like a, a robustness that's associated with each one of them. How difficult would it be to lessen the importance or, or make it greater uh, in your favor, presumably? So this is kind of a depressing comment, but let me make it anyway. You can look to history as somewhat of a guide toward some of the more important points, like damaging relations with Turkey, backlash from U.S. power players. Now look at history over the past 10 or 15 years. Turkey's refusal to allow the U.S. to use injured air base during the Iraq war didn't change any of that. Turkey's separation from Israel and the U.S. on the issue of Palestinian rights in Gaza didn't change any of that. It strikes me that these are very, very robust points and therefore extremely difficult to change. That's a very good comment. You can see uh, what, what you can change. and that's, uh, My argument is that if I know what I cannot change, that's already a plus. I know why I cannot change this. And I may think in scenarios what would need to happen for that to change or uh, what are the things that um, uh, haven't changed? And my assumption that, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, uh, Israeli-Turkish relations uh, souring somehow would have effect on that, right? Uh, I was thinking that that might be, and it's not working. It means that I was not maybe thinking right. I was probably uh, uh, bringing some, again, wishful thinking into this. I wanted this to be true, but it was not true. Some other pieces here were more robust and probably heavier, or just robust. And even that is uh, enough for me to understand where should I go next. Do I go and continue to do this, or do I do something else? And if something else, that's a whole different process. And uh, you still would do that, right? Now imagine that we're asking not to recognize the genocide, Obama, but something very specific. I still would do the same exercise. 
I would put there, should I now uh, give Armenians whatever they're asking this year? Church properties, okay. So should I now uh, give Armenians church properties? And I still would do this. Still would want to understand where are the things, where are the barriers, why he thinks a no is better than a uh, yes. Right? And that analysis would allow me to be better prepared and to go to him and to put on the table what we call a yesable proposition. It's easier, it should be easier for him to say yes to this. We should make it easier. And we'll do it only if we analyze it. Uh, okay, anybody else? Last one, really last one. How small is small? <laughs> personal opinion on that. Yeah, you can, um, uh, it gets, uh, it, it, it's not, I mean, our Papian, uh, a diplomat, uh, I, uh, I know him and I think that he was uh, uh, doing fine as a diplomat. Uh, he, is not, he has now chosen a more advocacy mode. So it's not a diplomacy, it's advocacy, which is fine. We need to raise awareness about, uh, about this. People have to understand that uh, this was uh, the process and where it was stopped and why it was stopped. All these are very important. And at the same time, I think that if you take and start uh, uh, negotiating with that and say um, it will be very similar to what we observed uh, a couple of days ago when, uh, uh, when Rafi Ovanisian said, give me this or I'll continue the hunger strike. Uh, give me this, this is my maximum list, give it to me, uh, or else I will go to a hunger strike. Uh, so, when you position yourself in negotiation with a maximalist, it may be that the, the other side, if you don't have power, back to you, if you don't have that power, you won't get it. And you may not get anything. But if you then start negotiating from there, it will be bargaining, it will be bargaining, and I don't think bargaining is going to be right for us. I think we might be able to get much more if we negotiate on our interests. And we stand very strong on our interests once we have defined and built the uh, national consensus around it. Oh. Okay. Well, the very short answer is Japan lost the war. And, uh, that's the very short answer to the question. Um, yeah, well, they did and they didn't. They managed to get away. Say, right? They lost one and they started another one right after it, and that one they they won. And that that was uh, that's uh, that's a very different case. Uh, yeah, it's uh, if you are looking for some uh, moral or uh, issues of fairness in that, there is none of that. Right? There is none. Unfortunately, there is none. And that's why I'm kind of recognizing the limits of uh, uh, value-based uh, foreign policy. I wish it were, but it is not. It's very hard, realist paradigm. And sometimes you can, uh, you can see these differences, uh, right? I mean, uh, you recognize Kosovo, and Rafi Hamanishan is right bringing that issue up, right? He's saying, you recognize Kosovo, and you don't recognize Karabakh. How come? You, Russia, recognize this, um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, you don't recognize uh, uh, about again. Good questions, but uh, this is not diplomacy. Because we know why they are saying no to us. The question is, how do you change that no? Not just saying that they are wrong by doing that. Because anyone can say that they are wrong. 
Anyway, I think uh, we can, uh, I saw a couple more hands, but we'll stop it here because uh, the time limit is uh, important for me and for everybody who's here. I would like to thank you all and I hope this, uh, this was thinking about thinking and uh, if nothing else, you will have some, uh, uh, some thinking about uh, uh, advocacy and uh, diplomacy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur, for a very stimulating evening discussion, and thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you at our next Thinking About Thinking lecture.